Moses realized that what he was now looking at was nothing compared to what he had seen before. Please walk with me very carefully. On top of Mount Nebo, Moses remembers Exodus 33 when he asked to see the glory of God. And God on top of Mount Horeb said to him, I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. I will pass by. You will see my back for no man shall see my face and live. And when Moses was standing on Mount Nebo and he was looking at Canaan land, suddenly Moses realized we have made a mistake. It is not the land that we were promised. Actually, Canaan land is not a place, but Canaan land is the presence of God himself. Moses realized we made a huge mistake from the day we left Egypt. We have always been in Canaan land because God himself was the Canaan land. All along, they were looking forward to land when God was the Canaan land. He was always the promise from the beginning. When Moses saw the land, he realized, no, I have seen better before. For the past 39 years, I have been walking with something better than this. This is why Moses can die in peace. Why? Because he finally gets it. It was not about the land. It was about walking with God all the days of our lives. We have always been in the presence of Canaan land. He was our Canaan land. Perhaps, let me explain this to us geographically so that you understand what we are talking about. You see, if I was God and I was promising the Israelites a, a, a promised land, I would not have promised them the, the land of Canaan. There are better regions that I would have given them. Let me just take you through this. If God was promising the Israelites a promised land, the first option would have been Egypt itself. Egypt is much more fertile and much more uh, uh, environmentally friendly than Canaan land. That massive river, the River Nile, makes all the difference. When the river Nile floods, it deposits the richest mineral salt in the world for nearly 10 kilometers on either side of the river. It will cover a 20 kilometer span, throwing the richest soil on planet Earth onto those regions. The river Nile and the Amazon River in South America are known for fertilizing the earth around them for kilometers and kilometers on end. And so if I had to promise my people land, I would have promised them Egypt. It would have been easier for God to overthrow the Egyptians and remove the Egyptians and keep the Israelites in Egypt. But suppose God wanted to give them something different. I would have promised them option number three would have been Babylon. Yes, Babylon. Babylon, again, has one of the best weathers in the Middle East. It has four massive rivers. And because of its location towards the northern regions, Babylon, as hot as it is, it also benefits from a very cold breeze 
two kinds of breezes one coming from the himalayan mountains pushing towards um, the central middle east as well as a breeze that comes from the other side from russia from uh, the norwegian regions and all those uh, 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 ice regions when that flows into the middle east it cools the land of babylon so if that is what i wanted to give my people i would have given them that if i wanted to give them some kind of warmth still egypt would have been a better place because egypt again will benefit especially in the cold of the night egypt will benefit from a hot breeze that comes across from Ethiopia, Somalia, and Sudan, and it curves right into the Egyptian peninsula, and it creates a better, warmer climate than in the other regions. Instead, he promises them Canaan land, a hostile terrain of mountains and extremes with a dead sea where nothing lives but salt and bacteria dependent on one river not massive river called the jordan in terms of geography canaan land is the worst kind of country you could give your people but there is something that is very important that god did for them that i need us to understand today then god says to them listen in the evening i will be a pillar of fire and in the day i will be a cloud what do you notice that god is doing you see what god did for the israelites for 39 years in the desert he gave them babylon and egypt at the same time because in the evening he would become the pillar of fire and so he would warm the desert for them just like Egypt is warm at night. During the day, he would become the pillar of cloud. He would cool down the desert for them, just like the wind cools down Babylon. And so what did God do? In the desert for 40 years, he produced the two countries in one. He produced for them the ideal countries. And he then deliberately takes them to a hostile country. When they get to Canaan land, how were they going to survive? They were going to survive because the aim was for them to know that it is not the country that will bless you, but it is the God who can make all things possible for you, regardless of where you are. This is why at the top of Mount Nebo, Moses realizes, oh my Lord, we were blind. We did not see that all along the promise was you. You were the Canaan land. You were the one that we were supposed to inherit. You know, dear friends, I want to tell you, there are so many Christians who are looking forward to heaven, who are making the same mistake that the Israelites made, not realizing when Jesus came down on earth to die for us, and when the Holy Spirit descended in order to take care of us, heaven came to us. It doesn't make sense. We are looking forward to heaven, yet heaven has always been walking with us all along. This is what Moses realizes on top of Mount Nebo, that the, the, the God that was walking with us was the land that we were looking forward to. And so Moses realizes Ah, Lord, it is good to die today because you have not actually denied me Canaan land. 39 years and a few months of walking with you, I have always been in the presence of Canaan land. But the story does not end there. Then begins the most powerful 
the most powerful funeral in the history of the universe. Never has there been a funeral like this one. You see, the funeral of Moses was attended by no one but God himself. And yet, in the absence of everyone, in the absence of caterers, in the absence of crying relatives with no casket, because God was there, God did everything. What a funeral to have God himself officiate in your funeral. The Bible says God himself opened the rock and God himself took the body of Moses and he put it in the rock. What a blessing, what an honor that at the end of your life you'll be crowned with God being present in your funeral. I wonder if God will attend my funeral and your funeral. In fact, through Jesus, I am guaranteed he is going to attend mine so that he marks that grave, so that when the trumpet sounds, my grave will open. I can only pray that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that he attends your funeral as well. And listen to this, listen to this. Then the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy closes there. It's done. Moses is dead, buried on top of Mount Nebo. It is finished. And in our minds, we think he dies there because God is punishing him for disobedience. But something doesn't make sense. If he's being punished for disobedience, why such a powerful and glorious funeral? Why would God honor him and bury him so beautifully on top of a mountain if at all God is disappointed with him? Oh, but dear friends, the story is not over. Then, more than a thousand years passes since the burial of Moses. We have heard nothing about Moses. And then something else happens. In the book of Jude, when we read the book of Jude, that one chapter, when we approach verse 9, Jude says to us, hold on, the story didn't end there. Then the Bible says, then one day God descended from heaven back into Mount Nebo. And when he stood on Mount Nebo, he opened the grave again and he resurrected Moses. Now, the Bible says no one knew where Moses was buried. Even the devil didn't know where Moses was buried. But when the devil saw God descend from heaven, he rushed to see what is happening. And when he saw God resurrect Moses, the devil contends with God. The devil says, no way, no way. You cannot resurrect him. You have not yet died at the cross. You have not yet paid the penalty for sin. As long as you have not done that, they are still mine. You cannot resurrect them yet. You have not defeated me. But God says, get away from me, devil. You have no authority to tell God what to do. And God takes Moses to heaven. Now I picture, because this is not in the scripture. This is now my imagination playing itself out. When Moses arrives in heaven, Moses is concerned. When he arrives in heaven, he is at peace. He is joyous to be in the presence of God. But Moses has questions. Why am I here? Why am I here? Because when Mount Nebo, when you showed me the future, you showed me that Christ must die before the dead are resurrected, before the second coming of Jesus. Why am I here? Because I see no one else other than me. And I hear Jesus in heaven saying, hold on, you will get the answers very soon. And Moses has to wait for about 500 years. And then one day in heaven, chariots of fire arrive and they are carrying a man called Elijah. And I picture in heaven, Jesus is saying, now, Elijah, let me introduce you to Moses. And I picture Elijah saying, oh my goodness, is this Moses, the father of our faith, the 
greatest prophet of Israel. We walk in your footsteps. And I picture God saying, hold on, Elijah. This is not the time for autographies. This is not the time for you to be catching up with Moses. Listen to me. There is a reason why you and Moses are here. And I can see Jesus, the eternal son of God, saying to Moses and Elijah, now you listen to me. In 400 years time, I am going down to earth in the form of a human being to die for humanity. But there will come a day when the weight of sin will be so heavy on me that I will not be able to bear it. On that day, the Father will send you, Moses, and you, Elijah, and you will find me at the mountain praying, and you will comfort me, because you, Moses, you will represent those who are dead in the graves, who will never resurrect unless I finish my work at the cross. And you, Elijah, you will represent those who will be alive, waiting for me at the second coming. And you will remind me that if I do not finish my work at the cross, then there will be no future for them. It shall be called the transfiguration. I will meet the two of you at Matthew chapter 17. And that is why when you read Matthew 17, when Jesus was praying and the disciples had fallen asleep, the Bible says, then Elijah and Moses appeared at that time. Now do you understand what is happening? You need to go back with me now and fill the gaps. When God said to Moses, you will not see Canaan land. When God refused to explain to Moses why Moses cannot see Canaan land. Look at what is happening now. All along, God allowed us to think Moses will not see Canaan land because he is punishing him for disobedience in Numbers chapter 20. But wait a minute, the story is now different. It appears Moses has received a promotion. Do you see what is happening? When Moses was denied the Canaan land, it was not for the punishment. God was now promoting him. When Moses arrives in heaven, it is a promotion. It is God saying to him, you were so faithful to me in the desert. I could not explain this to you, but I want you to know that you are here because of your faithfulness. Listen to me. The man who obeyed God in the desert for 40 years ended up being given the most special project of them all to be God's motivational comforter when God is on earth and feeling isolated. That's not a punishment. That's a promotion. What am I saying to you this evening? I am trying to tell you, learn from the story of Moses, that there are times when God will deny you Canaan land simply because he's got a bigger mission prepared for you. It is not true that when God denies you something, it is because he has something against us. The story of Moses teaches us, allow God to deny you Canaan land. It is because he has prepared something better. Yes, at the time when God denies you Canaan land, you are hurt, you are broken. You feel as though God is not being fair. That is how Moses felt. But look at this. When Moses now appears in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration, the man is occupying a much higher office than to enter Canaan land. What a joy that we see in this story. You know, dear friends, I want to tell you, in this life you are going to lose many Canaan lands. 
in this life we are going to lose many 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 canaan lands but i have good news for you and me this evening god will never deny you canaan land unless he is preparing you for the transfiguration mission if there is a canaan land you want and god is not giving it to you even though you have worked for it even though you have studied for it, even though you have prayed for it, and still God denies you Canaan land, do not weep at the top of Mount Nebo. Allow Canaan land to die at Mount Nebo. Allow some of your dreams to die because God has dreamt a bigger dream for you. That's the only reason why God kills your dream for Canaan land. It's because he's decided to assign you to the transfiguration. And the transfiguration is a greater mission than the Canaan land mission. Do not weep, my dear friends. When this world begins to deny you the Canaan lands that you are convinced you deserve, I have good news for you. Our God is not an irresponsible God. If he denies you Canaan land, it is because the transfiguration is coming. A greater mission is coming. Much bigger than the one you are losing. But I have another much powerful thing that this story teaches me. The story says Canaan land is not a place. Canaan land is the presence of God. Walk with Jesus every day of your life. It is not about getting to heaven. It is about making Jesus our heaven while we are here. We will get to heaven, of course. But the greatest heaven of them all is to have known how to walk with God in the desert. In the desert of your life, walk with Jesus. In the deepest, darkest hours of your life, walk with Jesus. The truest joy of heaven is to know God and walk with him while we are here. Moses, at his death, achieved two things. One, he realized that God was always with them and that Canaan land was always God himself. Two, he realized later after the resurrection that to be denied Canaan land was not a punishment, but it was a call to be used at the transfiguration, which is a higher mission. I want to say to you this evening, I know you might be in pain because for some of us, COVID-19 has come with the death of our dreams. Yes, it is true. In the year 2020, some of us had planned to do so many great things, but it now appears that those things will possibly not happen neither this year nor next year. For some of us, the only opportunity was this year. And now that this year has become what it is, we may not get the opportunity to do what we needed to do. It is dead. Our Canaan land is dead. For some of us, our Canaan land was our mothers and fathers, husbands and wives sons and daughters, uncles and aunts, nieces and nephews who died during this COVID-19 period. Canaan land can die, but the story of Moses says, wait for Jude chapter one, verse nine. Wait for Matthew 17. Whatever you may have lost in this period, it is not because God is irresponsible. Whatever you have lost, there is a transfiguration coming when God will repay all the losses, when he finally reveals 
why he allowed us to lose and what he was always prepared to give us beyond what we have lost. See, God will not cause us to lose, but God will allow us to lose when he knows that he's got a better plan for us. And yes, like Moses, God may not explain during the time of the loss why he is allowing the loss to happen. But in due season, we will be at the feet of the Gethsemane. And there will be a transfiguration there, and we will be there. And finally, we will realize why God allowed us to lose Canaan land so that we may be available for the transfiguration. I know that losing is not easy. And dear friends, we are losing. Every day when we wake up, a friend, a relative, a person that one used to pastor in church has died from COVID-19. Someone every day posts on social media that they have just received their letter of retrenchment. Every day we watch businessmen going on social media saying, I have just finished writing letters of retrenchment to my employees. I have just finished filling my papers for liquidating my business. We are currently at Mount Nebo and our Canaan lands are dying. But I am not ashamed to tell you a transfiguration is coming. A transfiguration is coming. Did you hear me? I am saying to you, wherever you are, no matter how hopeless you are feeling, listen to me. I speak to you in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. A transfiguration is coming. This is not the end of you. A transfiguration is coming. Do not weep over Canaan land for too much. You are not losing Canaan land because God hates you or because you are a failure or because God is punishing you. No, somewhere beyond what we literally read in the numbers 20 of your life, there is a Matthew 17, there is a Jude 1 verse 9, beyond the numbers 20, beyond the Deuteronomy 34, there's a Matthew 17, there's a Jude 1 verse 9, verse 9, there is a resurrection and a transfiguration. Wait, wait and mama not. Our God is able and he is not done. No, my dear friends, he is not done with us and this world, not by a long shot. I don't care how many people go onto the TVs and the social medias and question our faith. Our God is not done yet. There is a transfiguration coming. And I want to tell you wherever you are, as we begin this Sabbath, I want to leave you with this message as you worship this Sabbath. Do not forget, your transfiguration is coming. Whatever you have lost, are losing and will lose. It did not happen because God was too weak to protect it. Your losses are not happening because God has an issue with you. Beyond your losses, wait for your Jude 1 verse 9. Wait for your Matthew 17. A transfiguration is coming. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I want to pray right now with those of us 
who in 2019 are having to bury their Canaan lands. That Canaan land could be a family member, a friend, a business, studies, a relationship, and it may be even your own health. 2020 may be the year when your health is failing you, your Canaan land is dying. I bring you the good news. Transfiguration is coming. We are not done. We are not finished yet. We still have two more chapters in our lives that will summarize everything we have gone through. Just because today you are standing on top of Mount Nebo, just because 2020 is your Deuteronomy 34, and your life is filled with moments of numbers 20. Let me tell you, you still have two more chapters of your life. And the two remaining chapters are more powerful than any other chapter that has ever been written about your life. You still have your Jude chapter 1 and you still have your Matthew 17. It is not going to end in doom and gloom. It ends in the transfiguration. Things will be all right. Things will in the end fall into the plan that God has for you and me. Can I pray with you? If you are there, if you are making serious losses this year, if you are struggling with making peace with these losses, can we kneel on top of Mount Nebo today? And can we look forward to Matthew 17? Whatever you have lost, whatever you are losing, Whatever you will lose, weeping may endure for this night, but joy is coming in the morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your almighty throne of grace. We come before your awesome and magnificent presence. Among the many false and unreal gods that are worshipped in this world, there is none but you, because you are the only true, only wise, immortal, eternal, all-powerful God. In Amen. all places, at all times, only you are God alone. There shall never be another, there has never been another, and there is no other. We thank you, almighty and most powerful God, that you loved us before we knew you and you chose us for your purpose. This evening, Almighty God, we come before your throne of grace, accepting, weeping, and understanding that a time of loss will visit all of us at some point. And yet, Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this evening to solicit one thing. Do not allow me to give up until with my own eyes I see the transfiguration. Do not allow us, O oh Heavenly Father, to give up until with our own eyes we shall hear you say it is finished. Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, through his blood and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I come before your throne of grace this evening, pleading and praying that you take care of us in this year of darkness, that you cover us, almighty God, with your presence and fill us up with your Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, I plead with you to heal us in the losses that we have made, that we are making, and that we will make. And Father, in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray, guide us all to our Matthew 17. May our eternity be sealed in the knowledge that your plan will not fail. 
that this plan will see all of us through. Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray for those of us who are going through losses this year, who are in pain, who are giving up, who are struggling to understand the losses. Those among us, Heavenly Father, who are afraid of what the future will look like because we do not know if we will even be around for that future. Father, in the name of Jesus, hear our cry and our prayer. And I plead with you. God who has always been with us, God who has always been our Canaan land, the God who was always from the beginning our promised land, now even at this hour, be our promised land, our guide, our teacher, our protector, and our stay. Father, in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would visit each and every one of your children who are listening this evening, who are afraid, who are currently going through insecurity because things may not be adding up. This is the time and the season when the world ought to know that Matthew 17 is coming. A transfiguration will take place. Thank you, Father, for hearing us this evening. And now I pray that all of your children who are going through the circumstances we have prayed for may now believe and not allow doubt to fill their hearts, but instead to walk forward in the joy and in the knowledge that we are surrounded by a great promise that in the end, all of it will come right because of your name, Jesus Christ. And let all who believe say, Amen.